Hello, Holy Trinity family. I'm recording from Our Lady of Mount Carmel Chapel at the Basilica, the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception. Behind me, framed by two candles, is St. Therese of Lusso, whose feast day is today, October 1st. And today's readings from Job, from the Psalms, from the Gospel of Luke, are hard. Here are a few excerpts. Job curses the day he was born. Why was I not buried away? like an untimely birth, like babes that have never seen the light. And then the psalmist cries out for God in the day and clamors for God's presence at night. For my soul is surfeited with troubles. I'm a man without strength. You've plunged me into the bottom of the pit, into the dark abyss. And Jesus' disciples, James and John, breathe murderous threats about the Samaritans who would not welcome Jesus to their village. I'm telling you, no one can accuse our scriptures of toxic positivity. But some people do seem to see Therese's little way, not so much as toxic positivity, but possibly as a charming and a little too sentimentalized positivity. Recently, I have no idea how, a prayer card of St. Therese of Lusso, the little flower, came into my possession with this quote on the front. Miss no single opportunity of making some small sacrifice, here by a smiling look, there by a kindly word, always doing the smallest right and doing it all for love. Now, when I first read St. Therese's memoir, Story of a Soul, which she wrote when she was 24 and I read when I was probably 30, mostly what I noticed was that kind of positive language, smiles, kindness, small things with great love. I found Therese sweet and funny and what leapt at, off the page was her exuberance, her confidence that she was loved, her appreciation for beauty, her desire to serve, her self-deprecating wit. And I related to her youthful enthusiasm, her close relationship with her four sisters, her cheerfulness, and her desire for God at a young age. Also her vocation, written in all caps, warrior, priest, apostle, doctor, martyr, what I didn't notice then was how much the spiritual anguish and distress found in scripture and found in today's scriptures are also expressed in Therese's writing in life. As she introduces the topic of her mother's death, which happened when she was four years old, she writes this, oh, everything truly smiled upon me on this earth. I found flowers under each of my steps and my happy disposition contributed much to making life pleasant but a new period was about to commence for my soul. I had to pass through the crucible of trial. Just as the flowers of spring begin to grow under the snow and to expand on the first rays of the sun, so the little flower, whose memories I'm writing, had to pass through the winter of trial. And then she describes her anguish just a few years later when her second mother, her sister Pauline, entered the Carmelites. She writes, in one instant, I understood what life was. Until then, I had never seen it so sad, but it appeared to me in all its reality, and I saw it as nothing but a continual suffering and separation. Her winter of trial was most acute in the months before she died of tuberculosis at 24 years old, when she said, my little life is to suffer, that's all, and revealed to her biological sister, also a Carmelite sister, Reverend Mother Agnes of Jesus, she wrote this, I must appear to you as a soul filled with consolations and one for whom the veil of faith is almost torn aside. And yet it's no longer a veil for me. It's a wall which reaches right up to the heavens and covers the starry firmament. When I sing of the happiness of heaven and of the eternal possession of God, I feel no joy in this for I sing simply what I want to believe. It's true that at times a very small ray of the sun comes to illumine my darkness. And then the trial ceases for an instant, but afterward, the memory of this ray, instead of causing me joy, makes my darkness even more dense. Now, I know I'm sharing long quotes from Sister St. Therese, and you've probably read it yourself, or you can read it yourself. But I reflected on today's scriptures by rereading much of the story of a soul, and it was literally in the dark of the night when I read it, that fourth watch between 3 a.m. and 4 a.m., when for some reason I just could not sleep. And during that long night, which was last night, I also turned to the book Prayer in the Night by the priest Tish Harrison Warren, 
about a grief-filled and dark time for her and her reliance on the nighttime compline prayer of the monastic tradition. So I just ordered that book last week, and I wasn't having trouble sleeping. I wasn't having sleepless nights watching, worrying, working, weeping, or scrolling. Um, in fact, I've been sleeping really well. It's a season in our extended family of many blessings. So during these fall mo months alone, we are celebrating two engagements, two marriages, two births. These are six different couples, not the same two couples. But all the same, prayer in the night made me recall times when I have consistently had a hard time falling asleep. And during those times, I would listen to the Irish monks of Glenstall Abbey praying and chanting the Compline Prayer. And the prayer begins with them chanting in unison, God, come to our aid. Lord, make haste to help us. So here's the thing. Even in the midst of celebrations, we do have these intimations of sorrow. On the day that Mary and Joseph joyfully brought Jesus to the temple for his dedication, Simeon told Mary that a sword would pierce her heart. And on a day when Jesus and his disciples were having some really lovely, quiet, intimate prayer time, Jesus told his disciples, basically, oh, by the way, I have to suffer greatly, be rejected, and die. And I don't see him as being, at that moment, the omniscient son of God who foretelling the future, but really just saying what's true for all people. He was telling us the truth about what it means to be human. We suffer greatly, we're sometimes rejected, and we inevitably die. And like Peter the disciple, we might hear that and think, no, no, God forbid, don't say that. I don't want that to happen to me or to the people I love. Even though in our, first, in our gospel reading, the disciples kind of wanted that to happen to the unwelcoming Samaritans. But when we've been denying these painful realities like Peter, the disciple, when we seek to escape them, it can lead us to so many of the traps that can destroy us. And perhaps that's why Jesus, in that particular telling, responds angrily, get behind me, Satan. But wait, where is the good news in this? If we're paying enough attention, the good news is woven into the very promises that I've heard the young couples in my family make as they enter the sacrament of marriage, promising to love and cherish each other in sickness and health, in scarcity and abundance, in good times and bad, and even unto death. And isn't that the vow of love we all take to each other as the body of Christ? We tell each other that we will be with each other in our joy and our jarring pain, our celebrations and our sorrows. We're not alone. You are not alone. As the days grow shorter and the nights grow longer, know that we have each other to face the darkness with love. Therese of Lusso was in physical, mental, and spiritual anguish in her final days when she said, if you only knew what darkness I'm plunged into. Everything has dis disappeared on me, and I'm left with love alone. We are left with love, the love that lasts. Even when we wake in the night and feel alone, we can chant and pray the Compline with love and longing, and take heart, knowing others around the globe are praying the same way. Oh God, come to our aid. O oh Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be, world without end. Amen.